All right. Good afternoon and welcome. Um, I'm extremely pleased uh, to welcome Mr. Pedro Serrano, the Deputy Secretary General for Common Security and Defense Policy and Crisis Response at the European External Action Service back to IPI. We were just discussing it's been almost exactly uh, one year. Um, today I'll be on a slightly different topic. Uh, Mr. Serrano will be speaking on a partnership for peace, the European Union and the Sahel. Of course, this discussion comes at quite a critical moment for the Sahel. Um, there, this is a region that has tremendous potential, but realizing it is going to require overcoming very complex and multidimensional political security and environmental challenges. In central Mali, uh, amid worsening security, uh, worsening violence, of course, nearly 160 Fulani herders were massacred several weeks ago by gunmen in the town of Ogasu Ogasagu, following the resignation um, of the entire cabinet uh, in response to public criticism, a new prime minister has just been chosen in Mali. There are also worrying signs that jihadi and intercommunal violence is spilling over into Burkina Faso and Niger, compounding insurgency, criminality, and extremist activity in both those countries. Chad, too, faces challenges that put it at risk of instability, both in the north from Chadian rebels based in Libya and from Boko Haram in the Lake Chad Basin. The European Union and its member states are critical partners for the countries in the Sahel region. The EU has been a major contributor to the G5 Sahel Initiative since its outset, and together the EU and its members are also the main donors mm. in the region, providing nearly 9 billion US dollars to support development efforts. In addition, and we'll hear more about this, the EU currently has three CSDP missions in Sahel, two civilian missions in Niger and Mali, respectively, supporting national security institutions and strengthening the rule of law, as well as a military mission in Mali. Mr. Serrano is therefore extremely well placed to speak to the evolving situation in the Sahel and efforts to stabilize the region and address the underlying causes of insecurity. Following his remarks and a brief exchange, we'll open up the floor to questions and comments. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming the Dep Deputy Secretary General. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Jake, and, and thank you very much for hosting me here this afternoon. Many thanks to all of you that come to in, in this audience. Very important to discuss this issue and to discuss it in New York where so many uh, of the crucial issues and the future of the Sahel has been, has been decided as well in the UN Security Council, no doubt with um, the important UN mission in, in Mali, with all the very important assistance also given by UN agencies. So talking about the Sahel in New York is, and with the United Nations is particularly significant. And the Sahel is not just any other region, certainly not for Europe. It's a region with uh, very profound links to, to Europe. And the security in the Sahel has a direct impact, not only in the Sahel itself, but in the broader region. Certainly it affects um, the security of Northern Africa, but it affects also all the security in, in Western Africa. And ultimately it affects the security of Europe. So when we're looking at the Sahel, we're looking at a, a part of the world that is very important for overall stability. We further consider uh, the expansion of, uh, of um, extremist terrorism and the impact this is having in, in, in the Sahel. There is no doubt that we can leave no space uh, open where uh, terrorists can um, take over from weaker states, as was the case in 2012 in Mali. So we had already a very strong warning of what can happen and what we need to prevent uh, from happening. And uh, the presentation, we've called it partnership, and, and rightly so, because this is not about anyone doing anything uh, for others. This is about working together. And there is no doubt that the fate of the Sahel is first and foremost in the hands of the countries of the Sahel. 
and what the European Union wants to do with other partners, and the United Nations is a key partner, but also the United States and some of our member states that are very much engaged in the Sahel, is to reinforce this cooperation to help these countries um, um, take better grip on their future and push forward. We're talking about peace, and when you talk about peace, it's push forward an agenda for security and agenda for development, because it is very clear that there will be no security in the Sahel in the absence of sustainable development in the Sahel. And this is a challenge of tall order. If you look at the, the kind, and I'm, I will would talk of the Sahel, you could even go from Mauritania to, to Somalia. For the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to bring the Sahel to a smaller size, only 5 million square kilometers, uh, which is almost the size of whole Europe. Um, nevertheless, a smaller size, five countries. This is Mauritania. Uh, this is uh, Mali, uh, Niger, Burkina Faso, and Chad, which is already, um, as I said, a, an immense extent of, of land. And, and as you all know, and look at the index of, of development, these are amongst the poorest nations in uh, the world. 80% um, of the persons in these countries live on less than $2 a day. So that's an, an indication. Um, and on top of that, it is a region that is having a tremendous uh, population growth. Overall now, the uh, aggregated uh, population of the five countries I've mentioned is around 90 million uh, people. And there are, um, uh, it is foreseen that if the growth, which in some cases is almost seven um, children per woman, will reach 240 million in 2050. And as you can imagine, this will only make the challenge even greater. So this is the, uh, this is the, uh, the area that we're discussing and some of the uh, structural uh, challenges it is faced with. And as uh, if any of you have traveled in that area, you also know that the resources are, uh, at least uh, agriculture-wise, of course, it's, it's, this is desert uh, land, most of it, although there are, of course, areas um, uh, bathed by the Niger and other very important and beautiful rivers uh, that cross the region, which uh, allow, obviously, for agriculture and human uh, existence. Um, when we're looking at the challenges in the region, we're thinking terrorism, and uh, mostly, but there are, um, uh, security challenges are not only uh, terrorism, and terrorism hasn't appeared only by, by chance, and, ter and terrorism is not one type of terrorism, there are multiple uh, groups. I would say that the most important group is a um, um, reconversion of ACME, of the, uh, um, um, of the, um, uh, uh, yes, Al-Qaeda, thank you, <laughs> of the Al-Qaeda in, in the Sahel. Um, uh, and, uh, and this is uh, Jenin, but there are other uh, different groups, there are even groups that come from, let's say, more uh, uh, ISIS-affiliated mm -hmm. type of, of groups like the IGS, but other groups as well operating uh, in uh, uh, the frontier with um, um, Burkina Faso. Um, but they are, uh, the problematic is not only the groups that come uh, from the north, if uh, there, are, there is also terrorism coming from the south, and this is Boko Haram and Lake Chad, which is affecting Chad, Niger, and also um, even Burkina Faso. So we have really, uh, it is, uh, uh, you have different types of groups, terrorist groups, and coming from, from different uh, places. And that is, is not the only risks for the region. If um, you move beyond the Mali-centered problems and Libya-centered problems, you realize that Chad is facing other kind of challenges as well, not only the situation in Libya, but also Sudan, and including Central African Republic, which is, as you know, also in the state of this array more towards uh, the south. And if you add to the organized, the um, terrorist, the organized crime problematic, then you have a clearer vision, or at least um, you have put all the ingredients of what is the, the melange, the mixture uh, of challenges that the region is facing. And it is permeated by organized crime. Interestingly enough, organized crime that follows the same caravan routes almost that have been in, um, in functioning for, for centuries, and with stronger links between terrorism and organized crime as well. So a very uh, complex um, uh, situation. Now, how does one uh, handle and how do the countries of the region handle this? And they have been, I have to say, it's a, it's a region that deserves a lot of, of respect, also and courage that their leaders themselves have shown in understanding that the only way of addressing the challenges is by working together. 
And as you know, uh, three years ago, they created the G5 group, which is a sort of international regional organization with two main goals. And these goals have been um, development and security. And it is in that context, in the context of those regional efforts, that uh, the European Union is trying to uh, help uh, these countries. And it is important that they agree to cooperate because we will never be able to, it's, um, to stop terrorism nor organize crime in a single country because the borders are totally porous and uncontrolled and um, the flows uh, continue moving uh, throughout these countries uh, undeterred. The European Union has been investing very heavily. You mentioned uh, 9 million uh, billion uh, US dollars in a period of seven years. I have 8 billion euros, so mm. it must be roughly uh, the same amount. Um, and, uh, and in addition, indeed, we are supporting the countries um, uh, through um, our security and defense uh, missions and operations in the region. I will be talking about that. But one of the biggest challenges in the region is uh, the uh, outreach of the state, because most of these land, of course, is inhospitable and, 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 uh, and empty land. Uh, and it is difficult for the state to reach out and to provide services to all the populations. And this leaves open space for terrorist groups or for organized crime to control large parts of, of the country, or at least to, to roam freely in large parts of the country, and makes it a big temptation for many populations which do not have access to services to enter into the cycle of organized crime. And actually, when we're looking at the challenges in the region, each time you talk to anyone that is dealing with them, be it a local um, 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 authorities, um, the joint force, which I talk about as well of the G5, or international actors that are engaged, one of the difficulties very often is identifying the enemy. Uh, because the enemy may change, may change by night or by day, and it is difficult sometimes to say um, uh, whom you are really uh, uh, dealing uh, with at any uh, given time. The European Union is not the only actor uh, engaged in the uh, Sahel. We talked about the United Nations, and MINUSMA is certainly um, uh, making a major contribution uh, to peace in, in the region, but we also have other bilateral actors. And I would bilaterally I would mention France, which has a very important force deployed, as you all know, Barkhane, Operation Barkhane, which is fighting um, uh, terrorism. But the United States is also contributing in an important way to uh, the uh, stability of, uh, of the region. So the EU efforts uh, in supporting not only the development part with an important uh, programs, but also security has to be seen in that broader framework. And our uh, effort, since this is a partnership, is supporting what the countries of the region want. And in the G5, they have decided to create a, a joint force. This joint force is a relatively, can sound relatively modest uh, project because it's 5,000 men uh, for 5 million square kilometers. Uh, the main aim is to control the internal borders, uh, 50 kilometers on each side of, of, uh, um, of the uh, internal borders. And it is organized with a central command structure, which is in Bamako currently, and three sectors, uh, west, uh, center, and, and east, which have their different command structures as well. Um, in Mauritania, uh, you have one of the uh, command centers in Nbeket Alawash, which is uh, to the uh, south uh, uh, east of Mauritania and border uh, to Mali. In the central sector, the operational headquarters is in Niger itself, and in, in, in sorry, in um, uh, Niamey itself, the capital of Niger, and in um, uh, Chad, uh, the west uh, sector, which is essentially controls battalions deployed along both sides of the Niger-Chadian border up to Libya, will be placed in a place called Wur, uh, up uh, um, north. Uh, um, uh, north uh, west of, of, of Chad, but at present it's still in, uh, located in, in Jamena. And the role of this uh, joint force is to fight uh, both organized crime and uh, uh, terrorism. It, is, uh, it has a police component, which we think should be uh, reinforced to bring people to justice. And I think this is a key element as well, how we also engage with these countries, and I think that will have to be one of our, our tasks, to reinforce also their judicial and penitentiary chains so that they can deal with, uh, with what at the end are also uh, criminal uh, activities. It may sound little, I was saying 5,000, but it does have a transformational effect 
because at the end you have rotation of uh, forces. Most of these countries, with the exception of, uh, uh, of Chad, uh, which is the, the strongest army, almost 60,000 uh, men uh, deployed, all the others are smaller armies, and with um, 5,000 and a rotation over a period of five, six, seven years, you will have a large part of the armies of all these countries that will have been worked uh, through the system, been trained, um, uh, together through, um, because they have also de developed a defense college, uh, a college for security, a police college, so they're creating uh, structures that will help them develop a common, uh, um, a common strategic culture and identification of, uh, of the threats. And the European Union is one of the, uh, one of the main supporters of this effort. We're financing uh, this uh, joint force, uh, up to now, we've provided 100 uh, uh, million uh, euros to the force. We're, uh, we're going to deliver another 100 million uh, tranche, which has been already uh, agreed to. And through the operations that we already had in Niger and, and Mali, we are going to be providing as well training and uh, uh, advisory functions uh, to uh, these forces. We are in the process of what we call the regionalization of these operations. Operations were launched shortly after 2012 um, Malian uh, crisis. In Mali, we have a training mission, which is 800 uh, military, uh, European military are there, training Malian forces that are being deployed uh, uh, to the north, and now we want uh, that uh, we have decided uh, at the EU level that this uh, military uh, training mission and advisory mission will also be providing support to the training and advice to the other four nations for the joint force and on a case-by-case -case basis to the defense forces of each of these nations as well. Uh, because while, as I was saying, um, it will have the joint force will have a transformational effect, but at present it has to work also with the defense and security forces of the five Country. So we have to support the joint force and bilaterally the security and defense forces of the five countries as well. And then we have two uh, capacity building uh, missions in the field of security, one located in Bamako and the other one in uh, Niamey. And we're going to be using also uh, these uh, missions to support the police component that we want to encourage and further develop of the joint force and bilaterally each of the uh, joint forces of uh, uh, these uh, countries. We are uh, creating a regional coordination center for all these activities uh, that is going to be located in Nouakchott, working together um, with uh, the permanent secretariat of the G5. And therefore, everything that we're trying to do is uh, um, providing support to their own structures. We're providing support to the Defense College, the Security College. We're looking how we're going to be able to support the building and development of the police college in Jamena, and we want to support the structures of the permanent secretariat uh, and, of course, the OHQs of the joint force in order that they can fulfill uh, their missions. We've also developed uh, an instrument um, uh, called uh, uh, the, co the coordination hub. Voilà. <laughs> A coordination hub. Uh, we've developed a coordination hub in order to facilitate transparency uh, amongst donors on the needs of uh, the force, and this coordinate, which means that the coordination hub receives all the requests from the force uh, commander and, um, and provides um, um, donors the lists of those requests and transparency amongst donors so that there is no duplication in uh, the uh, support to the delivery of equipment um, to uh, uh, the force. We want this is an instrument that will probably uh, be supporting um, the um, um, uh, the uh, Comité de Soutien. They've created a support committee on their own with participation of the G5 countries, and this uh, coordination hub that we created supports the Comité de Soutien in their understanding of the needs of uh, the force. Uh, we are here very much aware that the effort that we are undertaking is a very long-term effort. First, because most of the uh, changes that need to take place are transformational changes of those societies itself. They have to evolve uh, socially and economically to be able to have sustainable um, development. And this is not something that we're going to achieve in the short term. And then there is very strong resilience in, let's say, the bad guys that we have to fight, be it 
um, uh, terrorist, be it organized uh, crime. And it is going to be difficult and a lengthy process to change uh, the way the societies are structured and to, uh, and to, del uh, and to remove uh, the negative elements, particularly uh, terrorism and, and organized crime. So it is going to be uh, quite um, uh, a long-term effort. We are aware that despite a lot of investment um, uh, of the European Union, we are seeing that the situation is um, extremely worrying, particularly, as, as you've uh, mentioned at the beginning, uh, central Mali, but also Burkina Faso. And, um, uh, and, and certainly the recent events, uh, very tragic events in central Mali, draw our attention. We were already well uh, uh, concerned uh, by what was happening in Burkina Faso as well. If you take a map of attacks in Burkina Faso, what has been happening in the north and northeast in, in the last uh, months is uh, also extremely uh, worrying and has a potential uh, for destabilization uh, of the region. Part of the problem is the absence of state structures in those uh, regions, the appearance of self-defense groups of one kind uh, or another as well, which adds to the uncertainty of the uh, population as to what kind of support they are really receiving from the state. So part of the efforts that we're trying to do, not only supporting the, the security forces, but also in programs to support security and state um, presence in central Mali, and the same thing uh, in, in Burkina Faso, where the percentage of, uh, of territory that is left uncovered by security forces, I can't remember right now, but it, I think it's close to 60%, which is uh, extremely uh, high, and you can imagine, of course, what that can be. They're well aware, the authorities are well aware, we've been discussing with them, and we are um, ready to engage even further in uh, addressing these issues. But obviously, it's the state uh, that has to assume responsibility and carry out um, those uh, tasks. Um, yeah, maybe um, not to be too too long, but um, I've talked about the G5, uh, but the situation is broader than only the problems coming uh, from uh, the north or coming from from Mali. And I've mentioned also the fight against Boko Haram, and I think that's another. A big area of concern. Here, countries of the region have also t decided to take active uh, action in fighting Boko Haram, and notably, uh, the, uh, they've created a multinational joint uh, force uh, by uh, Nigeria, um, uh, Niger, uh, Chad, and Cameroon to fight uh, Boko Haram, and notably in the Lake uh, Chad uh, region. And there, um, the European Union is also financing uh, this uh, joint force. We have already provided 15 million, 50 uh, million euros. We will be looking at further uh, contributions. Um, and um, they, um, the, I was in, actually in, in Chad just a few weeks ago, got a rather optimistic report from the commander of the, uh, of the multinational joint force of the progress that has been achieved in terms of reduction of attacks in the last year. They're also implementing interesting de-radicalization or, or reintegration programs. And, and obviously, the reintegration of, of, of terrorists uh, will be in the region, as, as uh, in many other places, a, a major issue. Um, true that uh, there are setbacks in reintegration and important setbacks, uh, but there is a, a, an important and deliberate effort, and we're also engaged with the countries in the region to see how we can support better um, uh, those efforts. One of our biggest concerns is the extension of, um, of instability and the spread of terrorism also to Western uh, Africa. Uh, Togo, Benin, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, other countries that could be threatened uh, by this. And so uh, it, that is why it is very important really to be successful. And right now we're looking at how to enhance our efforts, particularly as I was saying in, in central Mali and in, uh, in uh, Burkina Faso. Um, where we have, by the way, already uh, important programs to deal precisely with bringing state presence and security presence in the more um, abandoned parts of, uh, of central Mali and in, in Burkina Faso. Another point of, of concern, as I was mentioning, particularly for Chad, is Central African Republic, where, as you know, um, there's a process now also of... Uh, um, um, uh, there has been a, a 
peace agreement with uh, armed groups in, in Central Mali and here, um, uh, sorry, in, in Central African Republic. Here, the European Union is also supporting efforts of stabilization. We also have missions, a training mission, and we're looking how we can support um, police and security forces in Mali and how we can support, in particular, the implementation of this peace agreement, which has some interesting uh, aspects uh, it, uh, into it, and, and that will also contribute uh, to... Um, uh, um, to the security of Chad. And we have, obviously, the big issue of Sudan, which right now is, which is one of the um, borders of, um, uh, of, of Chad, and which right now is a, is a country in flux. Last point, maybe, uh, Libya, uh, where, um, in reality, mm, uh, many of the, uh, um, let's say, the destabilization mm -hmm. Uh, particularly in Mali in 2012, uh, was originated from uh, fighters coming from and through Libya, and where the uh, absence of, uh, of any kind of control over the southern borders facilitates the transfer of everything and the transit of everything. Uh, so no doubt that uh, uh, the uh, stabilization of Libya will be and is a key issue in order to bring stability to the whole region, and I don't have to um, to dwell uh, too long on how Libya uh, is at present. Uh, um, so that will also be one of, but there as well, the European Union is engaged in support of the efforts of the United Nations, and will be working uh, uh, as well to, to support the stabilization of, of Libya, and we also have missions actually deployed uh, to that effect. So. I would leave my initial presentation uh, uh, here, um, uh, underlining again that uh, um, the challenge is, is complex because it's not only security, it's developmental. developmental. It is uh, the need to transform the society as well, and it, it's a society that has to uh, evolve. When we think about the um, how can we substitute what um, uh, people in the some of the most remote parts of these countries substitute what they gain from organized crime with, let's say, licit ways of living. There is practically very difficult to find uh, an easy answer uh, to that, and probably the answer is a real uh, transformation uh, economically of the country and the way it is uh, uh, it is uh, structured, and that is something that is not done uh, easily. And while the security and defense forces cannot be uh, an answer, and actually we have to be careful with the fact that it doesn't add uh, to the problem, that's why in the joint force, actually the EU is also financing uh, a framework for compliance with human rights in cooperation also with the uh, United Nations. Um, uh, the, but the fact that they should not be a problem doesn't mean that they are not a very important part of the solution. Part of the effort is uh, has to go also into developing more of the security uh, elements, um, because in many of these countries, the m most of the effort has gone into more into defense than on security. And at the end, it is security and police officers that are closer to the citizen and that facilitate um, uh, the um, transfer of criminals uh, through uh, the justice uh, chain. So that is also um, a key issue. Cooperation with the United Nations in the whole region is very good and notably very important in, in, in Mali. And here, again, I want to pay tribute uh, to Minusma and, 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 and render homage to uh, persons that have lost uh, their lives in, in, in Minusma. It is a key, has a key role to play in the overall stabilization of Mali and therefore of the region. Important now also that they work and that Minusma starts working more in central Mali. And I think that's the direction of travel at present, and we will continue, of course, working with them. I didn't mention, I mentioned only at the very beginning, um, uh, Barkhane, uh, and uh, it goes without saying that uh, uh, the support of Barkhane in targeting uh, in, in well-led intelligence operations um, some of the terrorist groups uh, is also vital in keeping the uh, situation under uh, control. But at the end, what is required is strengthening those countries, uh, strengthening uh, their uh, development uh, and their economies and their social uh, structure, helping them overcome, in some cases, divisions that exist within these countries and intercommunal um, uh, disputes. And, um, and the European Union is engaged in all these efforts uh, in full partnership uh, with the countries of the region. 
So this is what I wanted to present uh, to you um, today, and very glad to take any questions that um, you or the audience may have. And again, many thanks for welcoming us. And for the European Union, just to underline that this is really um, a vital um, uh, issue. Um, thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Pedro. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was an extremely comprehensive overview, starting out with the, the five G5 countries and radiating out, uh, picking up quite a number of challenges in, in the broader region. Um, and I'm very glad to, to hear the emphasis that you had on the need to both address the, the sort of short-term security uh, aspects of this crisis, but also the, the longer-term developmental issues around poor governance, around marginalization, around the environmental strain in, in large parts of the region and issues of underdevelopment and corruption. And the fact that this is actually quite a difficult balance because there are quite immediate uh, insecurity uh, needs that need to be met, and yet at the same time we, we know that security ultimately isn't going to get us a solution, that the solution rests in these much longer term endeavors. Um, to start off with, I thought one of the things I, I wanted to ask you about, I mean, you mentioned the importance of the outreach of, of the state, uh, and particularly the ability of states in the region to provide fairly basic services, things like security, like education, like, um, like health care, yeah. particularly in the peripheral yes. regions, um, and the need for those states to assume a lot of the responsibility and to really own this and, and themselves to push it forward. And I guess the question is, I mean, in, in many ways, you know, you mentioned Libya, there are uh, external drivers of, of the crisis in the Sahel countries, but in many ways, those external drivers have found ripe soil in the sense that we've seen years of neglect and, and poor governance. Um, so the question really is, how is the European Union and its members trying to work with governments and communities in the region to try and incentivize the kinds of change that so far have actually proved quite elusive and yet which we know are, are of fundamental importance to the kinds of long-term solutions that you've touched on? Well, we have, thank you, thank you for that. And uh, we have a very active dialogue um, with these countries um, with constant uh, interaction, not only by through our delegations and our ambassadors in each of these countries. We have a special representative for the Sahel, um, a Spanish diplomat, Angel Losada, who's traveling constantly from one country to another, following obviously the peace process in, in Mali, but engaging with all the countries of the region, making continuously the points that we need to make um, uh, with them and engaging, understanding better the challenges they're facing and encouraging constantly also uh, these governments to tackle issues that are the outcome of not having also not having had the chance to tackle them before mm -hmm. uh, because these are not uh, new uh, situations these are situations that have these are, were fragilities that existed in all these countries and an aggravation of the situation as regards terrorism and even also organized crime for different sometimes even external circumstances uh, m make them very fragile and susceptible of being taken over uh, by uh, negative uh, forces. So we are constantly at a diplomatic level making this point. We have um, uh, yearly summits. Uh, the European Union has yearly summits uh, with these countries, meetings at the um, uh, defense and foreign affairs ministers level. In actually, in, um, in, in uh, a couple of uh, or three weeks uh, from now, uh, ministers of Foreign Affairs and Defense of the G5 countries will be traveling to Brussels to meet all ministers of defense and foreign affairs of uh, European Union member states and chaired by Madame Mogherini, the high representative. Um, uh, the high representative is engaged very much on the Sahel. She meets uh, all these ministers several times in very many places, but at least once a year formal meeting, and there will be again a formal meeting in... in um, in Ouagadougou in, in, in July. 
Um, important member states of the European Union are very deeply engaged, Germany and, uh, and, and, and um, Prime uh, Ch Chancellor Merkel herself is, has traveled to the region, has engaged, not to mention obviously President Macron. So the political engagement, the um, economic and development assistance, the assistance on security matters, and I forgot quite a few other programs that are interesting from a security perspective, but that we're also implementing in, in supporting uh, the gendarmerie type forces, for example, of, of, of these countries, and, and, and creating specialized groups to fight uh, um, um, uh, terrorism, and support and creating uh, and, and we have joint investigative teams also uh, by some member states in support of, uh, of um, the police forces of these countries, notably in Niger. So all these are constant efforts. It's a, it's a permanent engagement. Uh, even um, my modest level, I've, I've traveled to the region in three years. I've traveled to all countries twice and to some of them more than once, uh, more than twice. Uh, so constant level of engagement. There is, I think, in, in all of them, a realization of the high um, um, uh, magnitude of, of, of the challenges, but okay, they, it's, um, they have, uh, some of them have uh, considerable difficulties in terms of implementing capability. So again, it's supporting, it's uh, ensuring that we all is moving in the best possible direction and ensuring that, that the partnership, respectful of a national sovereignty and in full partnership nevertheless advances in the direction that will bring greater stability and greater chances for development. But it requires constant engagement and constant also financial and advisory support. You, uh, you've touched on the, I mean, in addition to the, the very significant role by the European Union as, a, as an institution, um, the strong contribution of several of, of your member states, not least uh, France through Barkan and its bilateral assistance, Germany. Um, we were discussing this beforehand and debating exactly how many different bilateral and mm. multilateral strategies there are, but at least 18, let's say. Um, I mean, given the enormity of the, of the challenges facing the region and the spectrum of assistance from the short-term su support to the development of security institutions to some of the longer-term development uh, aspects that we were talking about. Um, I mean, what, from, a, f from your point of view, how well does the coordination among all of these various actors work? And are there things that could be done to ensure that the ultimate aim actually is better aligned, better coordinated, more impactful? I think overall um, it works um, better than one would think, <laughs> certainly in terms of European um, uh, coordination. Um, and um, um, despite the number of actors, we are pursuing common and clear goals and, and objectives that we have identified. So from that perspective, I think that uh, it, it isn't, uh, and we are coordinating very well with MINUSMA. Actually, we are, MINUSMA is supporting uh, our projection uh, throughout Mali uh, by um, uh, our training, uh, military training mission and also our police missions. Um, we, the most important thing, I think, when you're uh, deciding how to handle a problem is at least have common objectives. And the objectives are common and have been identified very clearly. Now, of course, you have to revise your plan because things keep moving. And two years ago, Burkina Faso was not where it was right now. And two years ago, the situation in central Mali was not as worrying as it was. We had seen signs already, and we were already encouraging and had developed a, a very ambitious program for the uh, development and, and support of state uh, presence in central Mali, but the situation had not deteriorated as much as it had deteriorated. That's why there may be, you have the feeling that there are many, um, I don't know these 18 where they come from. I've heard mm -hmm. the same number. I know at the EU level we haven't managed to produce 18 strategies yet. No, we have one. Uh, we have revised it, and, and we do revise um, the kind of actions and the priorities that we have. And of course, the United Nations has one, the African Union has one as well. Um, but the major actors, I would say, which are the ones that we've mentioned, it's the United Nations, it's, um, it's the European Union, it's some of our member states. 
uh, and, and, and maybe the United States. We are all pushing in the same direction, working for the same goals. And one thing that maybe we could see whether we could make further progress is in how do we le leverage a bit better uh, the support and efforts that we bring. But apart from that, I think that it, the situation, it does sound a bit caricaturesque, but, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think is as, maybe I'm too optimistic, but I don't think is, is as bad as those numbers would, uh, would lead you to think it is. Maybe one final question before we, we open things up to the floor, and that's, that's on the issue of uh, migration from the region into, into Europe. The Sahel, of course, has been both a major source of outflow uh, of migrants, but also a transit point for, for migrants from, from elsewhere on the continent. And um, certainly that's been one aspect of the, um, the impact on Europe and, and its member states that, um, that is, is talked about in terms of why Europe is so invested in, in finding a, a solution to the region. Mm. Um, and I guess the, the question is, I mean, how do you see the balance between, and again, this is, I mean, in a way, much like one needs to balance the, the short-term security response and ad uh, addressing issues of terrorism. How do you see the balance between trying to address the sort of immediate symptoms of migration with efforts to address some of the underlying drivers? You, you touched on earlier the, the huge youth bulge. Um, one issue that's been uh, quite... Um, uh, in public scrutiny in this community in the last couple of days has to do with the, the German push in the Security Council on um, sexual violence in, in situations of conflict. And uh, I guess, the, you know, the question really is, what do you see in terms of long-term strategies, including things like women's education, access to, um, to reproductive health and, and things like that that might help uh, address some of the, the underlying drivers of migration and, and, and thus take some of the pressure off uh, your own domestic constituencies. Thank you. Not, I have to say that mm, migration has not been the main driver force for EU engagement in the region. We are aware of the broader challenges that this brings in terms of security. So it's not only um, an issue of, of migration that has brought the European Union to become active. Actually, the missions were deployed um, way before 2015, which is, and by the way, 2015 it was essentially uh, mm, uh, those coming um, through uh, Turkey into mm -hmm. Greece from uh, uh, the Syria and Iraq um, uh, crisis. So, um, so I wouldn't say that migration is the driver for the engagement of the European Union in the Sahel at all. Uh, we were engaged there way before the, the most uh, recent uh, migratory crisis and we are aware of the broader challenges uh, in, in the region. Having said this, um, the EU has developed a very complex and rich approach in its uh, uh, migration uh, policy. Um, of course, we, as others, uh, are in favor of controlled flows that we can integrate into our society. Migration is not negative in itself. It is even uh, beneficial, and some countries are, have been built on the basis of migration. Um, so uh, nothing against migration per se. It's just the control of migration flows and the capacity of countries and societies of integrating uh, and, 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 and making, giving good opportunities to those that, that, that join those countries. But we have followed a, a complex uh, um, a policy uh, approach, uh, which with transit countries, with uh, countries of origin, most of the Sahel countries are more, more transit than countries of origin, although some have had uh, in, in more recent years uh, an increase in, in, in as countries of origin, but still uh, relatively limited numbers. Um, and, uh, and so we have been active with countries of origin, uh, engaging with them, um, um, assisting in development, uh, uh, trying to develop also organized mig migratory flows. Um, and, uh, and obviously working in, um, for a stronger and a better control of borders. And I think this is very much uh, pertinent as regards the Sahel. 
the capacity to control borders in, in such uh, a, a immense uh, um, spaces and empty spaces and, and where borders are extremely porous. So that has been one of the um, aspects as regards engagement in the Sahel. Uh, obviously, in terms of uh, population growth, this is a, not only a problem for the Sahel, it's a broader uh, problem. Some of these countries are very conscious um, of this uh, uh, matter and, 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 and are trying to handle it, but it also has, as you know very well, um, social and religious uh, implications that may make it more difficult for some of them to move into um, reproductive health uh, um, uh, issues. Um, so that's one of the challenges that these countries are facing, and uh, part of the big transformational um, uh, social, uh, big, big social transformation that, that will be necessary over the next years. And again, here, uh, the European Union is supporting uh, these countries in, in these uh, efforts. But, but again, Sahel transit, um, some of them have cooperated very, and Niger has, has, has shown uh, ex extreme diligence in, in handling and, and, and ceasing to be a main transit route for uh, for trafficking of migrants. We have to say as well that trafficking of migrants feeds organized crime and that uh, um, migrants are threatened as well by the organized crime, the way they are treated in, uh, in, these, uh, um, in these routes. So Niger has been a very active uh, uh, participant and assisted and, and worked with the uh, European Union um, to help uh, control more its borders and assist uh, migrants that may be stranded in this territory and returning them to, to their countries. Great. Thanks very much, Pedro. We're going to open up um, for Q&A. We have um, probably enough for a, a long extended first round before I come back to the Deputy Secretary General. So if you would, uh, raise your hand and someone will bring you the mic. And if you would please introduce yourself, that would be most appreciated. The floor is open. Sam. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for this uh, very interesting uh, discussion. And uh, also, I'm, I used to work on uh, Mali and Sahel. Now I'm more on the East Africa uh, and Horn of Africa in the DPPA DPO in the UN. Um, I just have uh, two uh, quick questions uh, for you, uh, uh, Mr. Serrano. The, the, the first one has to do with um, that impression of and an increased substitution to national institutions in a way. And my question is, um, how far can we push to get stronger ownership by the Malians of all the programs that are provided? Uh, and in that sense, how do you assess the overall training that EUTM is providing to the Malian Armed Forces for the past uh, five, six years? And how can we all uh, work together to make sure that this army at some point has the capacity to defend its borders? My second question is, um, we're looking at the G5, and I think uh, since we started working on this uh, interesting concept, as you rightly say, the, re the resilience of the uh, terrorist groups uh, is much stronger and much faster, I would say. Their ability to adapt is quite uh, amazing. And the question is, aren't we already too late in enhancing eventually or expanding the, the scope of the G5 to other uh, regions. We now look at the border, the eastern border of Burkina Faso, toward Benin and Togo and Ghana, uh, increasingly affected by the, uh, the, uh, the, those elements. The possible nexus at some point between Boko Haram and, uh, and uh, Al Qaeda and Daesh uh, in Burkina. Um, I think maybe there might be a, a room here to discuss about expanding the G5 and merging G5 and MNGTF to have a kind of a longer Sahel uh, 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 integrated strategy uh, to fight uh, all those movements that are destabilizing the states and using the same methods in, in, to the domino effect. Actually. Thank you. Other questions? All right, uh, Pedro, why don't we come Sure. Yeah. Um, the stronger ownership, uh, no doubt. I mean, that uh, without ownership, there will be um, no success. 
Um, but here, I think I tried to reply earlier on how to achieve that and all the engagement with the countries. And, and the countries are really conscious of the um, one of the good things, I am, and, and in comparison to other regions that I have had the pleasure of visiting, is that in this region there is an awareness of the challenges they are facing. Increasing, I said, because maybe if I see what I was hearing um, two or three years ago and what I heard in my last trips uh, in the last few months, the awareness has increased nevertheless. Of course, the problems have also increased. <laughs> um, uh, but again, constant in, in engagement. And um, on, on the effectiveness of what we're doing in terms of UTM training, I would refer more to the judgment on that training by Minusma and Barkhan. And both Minusma and Barkhan judge very positively the training that is being provided by uh, UTM. And actually, we take back uh, also the um, information from, uh, from them and build it in, in our further training uh, activities. So I think that is uh, working as best as, as it can, of course, within the limitations of, uh, of ca the capacity of action of, of the armed forces of, uh, of, of Mali. But the training is, is being um, recognized as effective. Um, and um, uh, on the merging of uh, MNGTF and, and G5, I think that's um, um, probably you didn't mean it in that way because I think it's already enough, complicated enough to have mm, the joint force uh, working effectively and MNGTF working effectively, trying to bring them together. But at a political strategic level, uh, certainly being well aware of, uh, of the actions that they are respectively conducting and where there can be meeting points, I think, is, is of course, extremely relevant. And this is what we're seeing, that we start, you take the G5, and we started already reducing for the Sahel, and progressively you have to expand because indeed you have problems in Western Africa, indeed you have problems in Central African Republic, you have problems in, uh, in, um, in Lake Chad region, and all this uh, has to be seen as, as a whole. But I wouldn't uh, talk about it as, as in any case, and uh, nothing in terms of a chain of command uh, merger, or uh, I think we have to, uh, to respect uh, the role of MNGTF, which is also um, uh, circumscribed to, to a certain area and also the responsibilities uh, of, of the joint force and not mix them. But I agree with you as well that we have to see how we anticipate next moves. Are we being a bit reactive? M maybe yes. I mean, uh, right now, not that we didn't try um, to must move a, a, a further in, uh, certainly in central Mali. Um, uh, but, uh, but it is true that we have to look at the expansion of these uh, terrorists towards notably uh, Western Africa and, and organized crime that originates already mm -hmm. and comes already and enters through Western Africa. And, and that is, um, and I think we sh problem is that we say we should be looking and, and there are different parts that are looking into it, but we are sometimes taken by the more immediate uh, uh, concerns and, and, and do not devote maybe sufficiently attention to these moves, but we are aware of them, uh, which is already something, <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and I agree that we have to um, uh, be a bit quicker than, uh, than uh, those we are confronting in anticipating their moves and, uh, and expanding our protective action to regions that can be contaminated uh, um, in, in the future. Thank you. Other questions? Tom? Thanks very much. Uh, I'm Tom Benz from the US mission. Uh, like Sam, I, I, West Africa and Sahel responsibilities, uh, and, and, and now Sudan. Um, thanks, Jake, f uh, for organizing. Sir, thank you very much for your uh, comprehensive uh, discussion of, of many of the issues. Uh, uh, unlike Sam's very precise and, and eloquent questions, I, I have something kind of more broad on, on support writ large, writ large from the EU. Uh, the, the, the amount cited, $9 billion over sev several years, is, is a considerable amount. Uh, but I, I would just like to pose a question, not that, that I have a lot of insight into the EAS and the deliberative uh, 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 process uh, of the European Union, um, but mindful of the donors' conference in Nouakchott uh, last year and just kind of the, 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 the expansive needs in the region, uh, d does the EAS look at the map now uh, and 
to consider triaging European support uh, for, for areas where the situation is most precarious, such as Burkina Faso. Uh, given, given the again the statistics cited that now we're into the forty percent range of governance and security force presence uh, a, across the uh, the terrain there, and and any Burkinabe official uh, will will Im readily employ the metaphor of, of 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 their country assuming the role of the levy, uh, holding back the, the the flood of 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 the dangers emanating from. Uh, predominantly in the Liptako Gourmet area. Uh, so if you could speak to that, that'd be very helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. We're already, um, we're already um, uh, increasing our, our support to Burkina Faso. Uh, I, I can't remember right now the amount, but I think it was a considerable amount around 50 or 60 million um, euros um, in order to help uh, face the, uh, the challenges that it is currently uh, confronting. So we are very uh, active in, in analyzing the situation and trying to cover um, uh, lacuna as, as we identify it. And we are uh, carrying out a major mapping exercise uh, on our side on where are uh, the biggest uh, uh, challenges and what is it that we are and others are doing in those areas to see precisely now how we can encourage uh, the states of the region and support the states of the region uh, to um, cover those lacuna, be it in terms of state uh, um, that we know already, but um, again, a finer level of detail of what kind of projects we can develop in the most uh, the regions that are most at risk. So we're currently doing quite an ambitious mapping, and uh, to and together with uh, with the countries of the region to be able to enhance uh, the effect uh, of the delivery of our support. Thank you. Can I maybe ask you a, a, a corollary? Question, which is, I mean, thinking about the the spread that we're seeing into Burkina Faso, for example. I mean, to what extent, given the the resources that you, as the EU and your member states, have at, at your disposal, the the level of political attention that this crisis uh, requires, are you able to focus not just on the sort of tier one hotspots, let's say, but to approach it preventatively and, and to look at sort of what might be next up in terms of um, threat areas that actually might still have a, a decent amount of resilience if they had the level of political, you know, political support or, or resources to try and shore things up and prevent them from getting mm -hmm. to the point where it is a crisis and there's this imperative to, to act. Well, obviously, the main responsibility for the um, assignment of resources is, is uh, the governments themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and the assistance that we are giving them, it is for them to decide on their priorities. Of course, we work with them in the identification of those priorities. Uh, but it is essentially for them to decide what their priorities are. And what we can do is encourage them, which is what we try to do, and certainly right now in, in Burkina Faso. Um, to uh, invest more in, in certain kind of, uh, of efforts and sectors, uh, and that is uh, what we're doing. We have to work actually in, in two main lines. One is the overall uh, long-term structural um, reinforcement of, of the country and the state's structures in, in the country and delivery of services across the country and, and, and sustainable economy. So that's, let's say, the long-term uh, approach that we have to maintain uh, um, in any case. And then, yes, look at the uh, um, most uh, pressing uh, urgencies and emergencies, um, whereas, I mean, where we can add to that uh, an additional element of foresight. I, I would not dare that uh, this is um, uh, what we're doing all the time. We do try to anticipate, and certainly in this mapping that we're currently carrying out, we do try to um, bring a, a bit more foresight where would be the, the areas of greater fragility. And it is that in that context, actually, that we're um, considering the need uh, to look beyond the G5 itself. Um, and, and, and certainly looking at the situation in, in West Africa. Um, but yeah, so yes, a certain level of anticipation is required. Are we um, doing a great job already on it? 
Mm, probably not. Um, are we aware of it? Yes. Um, is it our sole responsibility? No, it's, it's the countries of the region's main responsibility. We can try to guide and support and advise, and we can learn also from them and how they see their and perceive their own uh, realities. And, and if there's a mismatch, trying to, to understand why there is a mismatch and trying to reach an agreement on how to advance more effectively. Last questions? All right, great. Okay. Please join me Many in thanks. thanking Idris Rana. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jake. Yeah. Pleasure. Great.